1964 United States Presidential Election The United States Presidential Election of 1964, the 45th Quadrennial American Presidential Election, was held on Tuesday, November 3, 1964. Incumbent Democratic President Lyndon B. Johnson defeated Barry Goldwater, the Republican nominee. With 61.1% of the popular vote, Johnson won the largest share of the popular vote of any candidate since the largely uncontested 1820 election. Johnson had come to office in November 1963 following the assassination of his predecessor, John F. Kennedy. He easily defeated a primary challenge by segregationist Governor George Wallace of Alabama to win nomination to a full term. At the 1964 Democratic National Convention, Johnson also won the nomination of his preferred running mate, Senator Hubert Humphrey of Minnesota. Senator Barry Goldwater of Arizona, a leader of his party's conservative faction, defeated moderate Governor Nelson Rockefeller of New York and Governor William Scranton of Pennsylvania at the 1964 Republican National Convention. Johnson championed his passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, and his campaign advocated a series of anti-poverty programs collectively known as the Great Society. Goldwater espoused a low-tax, small-government philosophy, and opposed the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Democrats successfully portrayed Goldwater as a dangerous extremist, most famously in the Daisy television advertisement. The Republican Party was badly divided between its moderate and conservative factions, with Rockefeller and other moderate party leaders refusing to campaign for Goldwater. Johnson led by wide margins in all opinion polls conduct entering the campaign. Johnson carried 44 states and the District of Columbia, which voted for the first time in this election. Goldwater won his home state and swept the states off Deep South, most of which had not voted for a Republican presidential candidate since the end of Reconstruction in 1877. Johnson's landslide victory coincided with the defeat of many conservative Republican congressmen, and the subsequent 89th Congress would pass major legislation such as the Social Security Amendments of 1965 and the Voting Rights Act. Goldwater's unsuccessful bid significantly influenced the modern conservative movement and the long-time realignment within the Republican Party, which culminated in the 1980 presidential victory of Ronald Reagan. While on the first campaign stop of his re-election campaign, President Kennedy was assassinated on November 22, 1963 in Dallas, Texas. Supporters were shocked and saddened by the loss of the charismatic president, while opposition candidates were put in the awkward position of running against the policies of a slain political figure. During the following period of mourning, Republican leaders called for a political moratorium, so as not to appear disrespectful. As such, little politicking was done by the candidates of either major party until January 1964. When the primary season officially began. At the time, most political pundits saw Kennedy's assassination as leaving the nation politically unsettled. The only other candidate to actively campaign was then Alabama Governor George Wallace, who ran in a number of northern primaries, though his candidacy was more to promote the philosophy of states' rights among a northern audience. While expecting some support from delegations in the South, Wallace was certain that he was not in contention for the Democratic nomination. Johnson received 1,106,999 votes in the primaries. At the national convention the integrated Mississippi Freedom Democratic Party claimed the seats for delegates for Mississippi, not on the grounds of the party rules, but because the official Mississippi delegation had been elected by a white primary system. The national party's liberal leaders supported an even division of the seats between the two Mississippi delegations. Johnson was concerned that, while the regular Democrats of Mississippi would probably vote for Goldwater anyway, rejecting them would lose him the South. Eventually, Hubert Humphrey, Walter Ruther, and the black civil rights leaders, including Roy Wilkins, Martin Luther King Jr., and Baird Rustin, worked out a compromise. The MFDP took two seats. The regular Mississippi delegation was required to pledge to support the party ticket, and no future Democratic convention would accept a delegation chosen by a discriminatory poll. Joseph L. Raw Jr., the MFDP's lawyer, initially refused this deal, but they eventually took their seats. Many white delegates from Mississippi and Alabama refused to sign any pledge, and left the convention, and many young civil rights workers were offended by any compromise. Johnson biographers Roland Evans and Robert Novak claimed that the MFDP fell under the influence of black radicals and rejected their seats. Johnson lost Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi, Georgia, and South Carolina. Johnson also faced trouble from Robert F. Kennedy, 
President Kennedy's younger brother and the U.S. Attorney General. Kennedy and Johnson's relationship was troubled from the time Robert Kennedy was a Senate staffer. Then Majority Leader Johnson surmised that Kennedy's hostility was the direct result of the fact that Johnson frequently recounted a story that embarrassed Kennedy's father, Joseph P. Kennedy, the ambassador to the United Kingdom. According to his recounting, Johnson and President Franklin D. Roosevelt misled the ambassador, upon a return visit to the United States, to believe that Roosevelt wished to meet in Washington for friendly purposes, in fact Roosevelt planned to, and did, fire the ambassador, due to the ambassador's well-publicized views. The Johnson-Kennedy hostility was rendered mutual in the 1960 primaries and the 1960 Democratic National Convention, when Robert Kennedy had tried to prevent Johnson from becoming his brother's running mate a move that deeply embittered both men. In early 1964, despite his personal animosity for the president, Kennedy had tried to force Johnson to accept him as his running mate. Johnson eliminated this threat by announcing that none of his cabinet members would be considered for second place on the Democratic ticket. Johnson also became concerned that Kennedy might use his scheduled speech at the 1964 Democratic convention to create a groundswell of emotion among delegates to make him Johnson's running mate. He prevented this by deliberately scheduling Kennedy's speech on the last day of the convention, after his running mate had already been chosen. Shortly after the 1964 Democratic convention, Kennedy decided to leave Johnson's cabinet and run for the U.S. Senate in New York. He won the general election in November. Johnson chose Senator Hubert Humphrey from Minnesota, a liberal and civil rights activist, as his running mate. The Republican Party was badly divided in 1964 between its conservative and moderate liberal factions. Former Vice President Richard Nixon, who had been beaten by Kennedy in the extremely close 1960 presidential election, decided not to run. Nixon, a moderate with ties to both wings of the GOP, had been able to unite the factions in 1960. In his absence, the way was clear for the two factions to engage in an all out political civil war for the nomination. Barry Goldwater a senator from Arizona, was the champion of the conservatives. The conservatives had historically been based in the American Midwest, but beginning in the 1950s they had been gaining in power in the South and West. The conservatives favored a low-tax, small federal government which supported individual rights and business interests and opposed social welfare programs. The conservatives also resented the dominance of the GOP's moderate wing, which was based in the northeastern United States. Since 1940, the Eastern moderates had successfully defeated conservative presidential candidates at the AGOPS national conventions. The conservatives believed the Eastern moderates were a little different from liberal Democrats in their philosophy and approach to government. Goldwater's chief opponent for the Republican nomination was Nelson Rockefeller, the governor of New York and the longtime leader of the AGOPS liberal moderate faction. Initially, Rockefeller was considered the frontrunner, ahead of Goldwater. However, in 1963, Two years after Rockefeller's divorce from his first wife, he married Margarita Happy Murphy, who was nearly 18 years younger than he and had just divorced her husband and surrendered her four children to his custody. The fact that Murphy had suddenly divorced her husband before marrying Rockefeller led to rumors that Rockefeller had been having an extramarital affair with her. This angered many social conservatives and female voters within the GOP, many of whom called Rockefeller a wife-stealer. After his remarriage, Rockefeller's lead among Republicans lost 20 points overnight. Senator Prescott Bush of Connecticut, the father of President George H. W. Bush and grandfather of President George W. Bush, was among Rockefeller's critics on this issue. Have we come to the point in our life as a nation where the governor of a great state, one who perhaps aspires to the nomination for President of the United States, can desert a good wife, mother of his grown children, divorce her? then persuade a young mother of four youngsters to abandon her husband and their four children and marry the governor. In the first primary, in New Hampshire, both Rockefeller and Goldwater were considered to be the favorites, but the voters instead gave a surprising victory to the U.S. ambassador to South Vietnam, Henry Cabot Lodge Jr., Nixon's running mate in 1960 and a former Massachusetts senator. Lodge was a write-in candidate. He went on to win the Massachusetts and New Jersey primaries before withdrawing his candidacy because he had finally decided didn't want the Republican nomination. Despite his defeat in New Hampshire, Goldwater pressed on, winning the Illinois, Texas, and Indiana primaries with little opposition, and Nebraska's primary after a stiff challenge from a draft Nixon movement. Goldwater also won a number of state caucuses and gathered even more delegates. Meanwhile, 
Nelson Rockefeller won the West Virginia and Oregon primaries against Goldwater, and William Scranton won in his home state of Pennsylvania. Both Rockefeller and Scranton also won several state caucuses, mostly in the Northeast. The final showdown between Goldwater and Rockefeller was in the California primary. In spite of the previous accusations regarding his marriage, Rockefeller led Goldwater in most opinion polls in California, and he appeared headed for victory when his new wife gave birth to a son, Nelson Rockefeller Jr., three days before the primary. His son's birth brought the issue of adultery front and center, and Rockefeller suddenly lost ground in the polls. Goldwater won the primary by a narrow 51 to 49 percent margin, thus eliminating Rockefeller as a serious contender in all but clinching the nomination. With Rockefeller's elimination, the party's moderates and liberals turned to William Scranton, the governor of Pennsylvania, in the hopes that he could stop Goldwater. However, as the Republican convention began, Goldwater was seen as the heavy favorite to win the nomination. Total popular vote The 1964 Republican National Convention at Daly City, California's Cal Palace Arena was one of the most bitter on record, as the party's moderates and conservatives openly expressed their contempt for each other. Rockefeller was loudly booed when he came to the podium for his speech. In his speech, he roundly criticized the party's conservatives, which led many conservatives in the galleries to yell and scream at him. A group of moderates tried to rally behind Scranton to stop Goldwater. But Goldwater's forces easily brushed his challenge aside, and Goldwater was nominated on the first ballot. The presidential tally was as follows. The vice presidential nomination went to little known Republican Party chairman William E. Miller, a representative from upstate New York. Goldwater stated that he chose Miller simply because he drives President Johnson nuts. This would be the only Republican ticket between 1948 and 1976 that did not include Nixon. In accepting his nomination, Goldwater uttered his most famous phrase, I would remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is no vice. And let me remind you also that moderation in the pursuit of justice is no virtue. For many GOP moderates, Goldwater's speech was seen as a deliberate insult, and many of these moderates would defect to the Democrats in the fall election. Although Goldwater had been successful in rallying conservatives, he was unable to broaden his base of support for the general election. Shortly before the Republican convention, he had alienated moderate Republicans by his vote against the Civil Rights Act of 1964, which Johnson Champion Dan signed into law. Goldwater said that he considered desegregation a state's rights issue, rather than a national policy, and believed the 1964 act to be unconstitutional. Goldwater's vote against the legislation helped cause African Americans to overwhelmingly support Johnson. Goldwater had previously voted in favor of the 1957 and 1960 Civil Rights Acts, but only after proposing restrictive amendments to them. Goldwater was famous for speaking off the cuff at times, and many of his former statements were given wide publicity by the Democrats. In the early 1960s, Goldwater had called the Eisenhower administration a dime store New Deal, and the former president never fully forgave him or offered him his full support in the election. In December 1961, he told a news conference that sometimes I think this country would be better off if we could just saw off the eastern seaboard and let you float out to sea, a remark which indicated his dislike of the liberal economic and social policies that were often associated with that part of the nation. That comment came back to haunt him, in the form of a Johnson television commercial, as did remarks about making Social Security voluntary and selling Tennessee Valley Authority. In his most famous verbal gaffe, Goldwater once joked that the U.S. military should lob one, a nuclear bomb, into the men's room of the Kremlin in the Soviet Union. Goldwater was also hurt by the reluctance of many prominent moderate Republicans to support him. Governors Nelson Rockefeller of New York and George Romney of Michigan refused to endorse Goldwater and did not campaign for him. On the other hand, former Vice President Richard Nixon and Governor Scranton of Pennsylvania loyally supported the GOP ticket and campaigned for Goldwater. Although Nixon did not entirely agree with Goldwater's political stances and said that it would be a tragedy if Goldwater's platform were not challenged and repudiated by the Republicans. The New York Herald Tribune, a voice for Eastern Republicans, supported Johnson in the general election. Some moderates even formed the Republicans for Johnson organization, although most prominent GOP politicians avoided being associated with it. Shortly before the Republican convention, CBS reporter Daniel Shaw wrote from Germany that it looks as though Senator Goldwater, if nominated, will be starting his campaign here in Bavaria, center of Germany's right wing.
He noted that a prior Goldwater interview with the German magazine Der Spiegel was an appeal to right-wing elements. However, though there was no ulterior motive for the trip, it was just a vacation. Fact magazine published an article polling psychiatrists around the country as to Goldwater's sanity. Some 1,189 psychiatrists appear to agree that Goldwater was emotionally unstable and unfit for office, though none of the members had actually interviewed him. The article received heavy publicity and resulted in a change to the ethics guidelines of the American Psychiatric Association. In a libel suit, a federal court awarded Goldwater $1 in compensatory damages and $75,000 in punitive damages. Eisenhower's strong backing could have been an asset to the Goldwater campaign, but instead its absence was clearly noticed. When questioned about the presidential capabilities of the former president's younger brother, University Administrator Milton S. Eisenhower, in July 1964, Goldwater replied, One Eisenhower in a generation is enough. However, Eisenhower did not openly repudiate Goldwater in Medeo and television commercial for Goldwater's campaign. A prominent Hollywood celebrity who vigorously supported Goldwater was Ronald Reagan. Reagan gave a well received televised speech supporting Goldwater. It was so popular that Goldwater's advisors had it played on local television stations around the nation. Many historians consider this speech a time for choosing to mark the beginning of Reagan's transformation from an actor to a political leader. In 1966, Reagan would be elected governor of California in a landslide. Johnson positioned himself as a moderate and succeeded in portraying Goldwater as an extremist. Goldwater had a habit of making blunt statements about war, nuclear weapons, and economics that could be turned against him. Most famously, the Johnson campaign broadcast a television commercial on September 7 dubbed the Daisy Girl ad, which featured a little girl picking petals from a daisy in a field, counting the petals, which then segues into a launch countdown and a nuclear explosion. The ads were in response to Goldwater's advocacy of tactical nuclear weapons used in Vietnam. Confessions of a Republican, another Johnson ad, features a monologue from a man who tells us that he had previously voted for Eisenhower and Nixon, but now worries about the men with strange ideas, weird groups and the head of the Ku Klux Klan who were supporting Goldwater, he concludes that either they're not Republicans, or I'm not. Voters increasingly view Goldwater as a right-wing fringe candidate. His slogan in your heart you know he's right was successfully parodied by the Johnson campaign into In Your Guts, You Know He's Nuts, or In Your Heart, You Know He Might, or Even In Your Heart, He's Too Far Right. Some cynics wore buttons saying even Johnson is better than Goldwater. The Johnson campaign's greatest concern may have been voter complacency leading to low turnout in key states. To counter this, all of Johnson's broadcast it's concluded with the line, Vote for President Johnson on November 3rd. The stakes are too high for you to stay home. The Democratic campaign used two other slogans, all the way with LBJ and LBJ for the USA. The election campaign was disrupted for a week by the death of former President Herbert Hoover on October 20, 1964, because it was considered disrespectful to be campaigning during a time of mourning. Hoover died of natural causes. He had been U.S. President from 1929 to 1933. Both major candidates attended his funeral. Johnson led in all opinion polls by huge margins throughout the entire campaign. The election was held on November 3, 1964. Johnson beat Goldwater in the general election, winning over 61% of the popular vote, the highest percentage since the popular vote first became widespread in 1824. In the end, Goldwater won only his native state of Arizona and five deep south states, Louisiana, Mississippi, Georgia, Alabama and South Carolina which had been increasingly alienated by Democratic civil rights policies. This was the best showing in the South for a GOP candidate since Reconstruction. The five southern states that voted for Goldwater swung over dramatically to support him. For instance, in Mississippi, where Democrat Franklin D. Roosevelt had won 97 percent of the popular vote in 1936, Goldwater won 87 percent of the vote. Of these states, Louisiana had been the only state where a Republican had won even once since Reconstruction. Mississippi, Alabama and South Carolina had not voted Republican in any presidential election since Reconstruction, whilst Georgia had never voted Republican even during Reconstruction. The 1964 election was a major transition point for the South, and an important step in the process by which the Democrats' former Solid South became a Republican bastion. Nonetheless, Johnson still managed to eke out a bare popular majority of 51 to 49 percent in the 11 former Confederate states. 
Conversely, Johnson was the first Democrat ever to carry the state of Vermont in a presidential election, and only the second Democrat, after Woodrow Wilson in 1912 when the Republican Party was divided, to carry Maine in the 20th century. Maine and Vermont had been the only states that FDR had failed to carry during any of his four successful presidential bids. Of the 3,126 counties-slash-districts-slash-independent cities making returns, Johnson won in 2,275 while Goldwater carried 826. Unpledged electors carried six counties in Alabama. The Johnson landslide defeated many conservative Republican congressmen, giving him a majority that could overcome the conservative coalition. This is the first election to have participation of the District of Columbia under the 23rd Amendment to the U.S. Constitution. The Johnson campaign broke two American election records previously held by Franklin Roosevelt, the most number of electoral college votes won by a major party candidate running for the White House for the first time and the largest share of the popular vote under the current Democratic-slash-Republican competition. This first-time electoral count was exceeded when Ronald Reagan won 489 votes in 1980. Johnson retains the highest percentage of the popular voters of the 2016 election. Source, source. Margin of victory less than 1%. Margin of victory less than 5%. Margin of victory over 5%, but less than 10%. Although Goldwater was decisively defeated, some political pundits and historians believe he laid the foundation for the conservative revolution to follow. Ronald Reagan's speech on Goldwater's behalf, grassroots organization, and the conservative takeover of the Republican Party would all help to bring about the Reagan Revolution of the 1980s. Johnson went from his victory in the 1964 election to launch the Great Society program at home, signing the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and starting the war in poverty. He also escalated the Vietnam War, which eroded his popularity. By 1968, Johnson's popularity had declined and the Democrats became so split over his candidacy that he withdrew as a candidate. Moreover, his support of civil rights for blacks helped split white union members and Southerners away from Franklin Roosevelt's Democratic New Deal coalition, which would later lead to the phenomenon of the Reagan Democrat. Of the 13 presidential elections that followed up to 2016, Democrats would win only five times. The election also furthered the shift of the black voting electorate away from the Republican Party, a phenomenon which had begun with the New Deal. Since the 1964 election, Democratic presidential candidates have almost consistently won at least 80 to 90 percent of the black vote in each presidential election. Thanks for watching. Don't forget like the video and don't forget to subscribe.